السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين From what I was told about this gathering, I, first of all, I'd like to express how honored I feel and what a great opportunity it is to be in such noble company. Uh, what I was told about this gathering was that there are people in this audience that have quite a bit of experience in the field of da'wah. They're very active in that field in various capacities. Uh, and this is da'wah done not only to the Muslim community, but also to the non-Muslim community. And of course the ayah that I recited for anybody who is involved in this field is probably very, very familiar with this ayah and they've heard it many, many times. What I'd like to share with you today is that this ayah contains in it an incredible number of lessons. It's, it's a pretty remarkable brief statement in the Quran, but it contains in it volumes of wisdom. And what I'd like to do in these 30 minutes is to highlight at least two dimensions of this ayah. So there's two, there's many ways of extrapolating or benefiting from this ayah, but there are two that I'd like to highlight before you. In a rough translation, Allah is saying, Ud'u ila sabili rabbik, call to the path or the way of your master. Bil hikmah, you can translate that as using wisdom. Wal mawaidatil hasana, and to give, and by using good counsel, good advice, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ And argue with them or debate with them, or engage with them in a way that is better. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ ضَلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ Your master certainly, he is far more knowledgeable of who is misled or who is lost straight away from his path. وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ And he knows the people that are committed to guidance. Now in that statement, when Allah says, the, where I'd like to start, he says, call to the path of your master. And the idea of calling or inviting someone, the first interesting thing is you don't invite someone to a path. You invite someone to a destination. If you give someone an invitation, you give them an address, which is not the road, but what goes at the end of that road. So it's really unique that in this ayah, instead of Allah saying, call them to the destination, He said, call them to the path. وَدْعُوا إِلَى سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ This is unique already. This has many implications. Think about this. When you're calling some people to a road or a path, that means not everybody has the same starting point. Not everybody's traveling at the same speed. Not everybody's actually making the same kind of progress. Some people are far ahead in the journey. Some people are far behind in the journey. And you have to assess who are you calling and maybe the person you're calling, they're far behind on the road and that's okay, so long as they're on the road. And some people are far ahead on the road and that's okay, because they, they are you know, more capable to be farther ahead on the road. And some people, when they get on this road, they're going to travel very, very fast. And they're going to make progress very, very fast. And some people who get on this road, you know, some people are on a, in a you can imagine they're in a car, or on a motorcycle, and some people are on a, on a cycle, and other people are walking. Other people are running and other people are walking. And there are some people that are crawling. But so long as they're on the road and they're making progress, the job is being done. And what that does is it's not one standard for da'wah. When you're, when you're giving da'wah to someone, and they even accept this deen, or maybe you're giving da'wah to someone in your family who's not very particularly practicing, you don't expect from them the same level of progress and the same kind of change that you had or their brother had, or their cousin had, or somebody else. You can't compare them to anybody else. So long as there is some kind of progress, it's okay. So long as there's some kind of progress. And by the way, there are sometimes people that, that, that are on a road, and they're just standing there on the side. Have you ever seen that? They're not even moving. And you would think, why isn't he moving? Well, you know what, maybe they're changing a the tire, maybe they're fixing something, and then they're going to be on their way. There are some people who have made quite a bit of progress, but you don't see it. Like you don't see that they're changing or evolving. I don't see any differences. Because a lot of the differences, a lot of times the change that is happening is on the inside. They're still thinking about things. They're pondering things. They're reflecting things. You might give somebody advice, 
and you think nothing happened. I, I told him to pray and he still didn't pray. But he's thinking about it. And maybe three weeks from now, from now he'll start praying. It takes him some time to process. And that's part of the beauty of ud'u ila sabili rabbik. The other thing is the, the idafa. You know, it could have been ud'u ila l-islam. Call to Islam. But he didn't say that. He said the path of your master. So th- this, this phrase rabbik is also important because now Allah is saying this road, this path that we are inviting towards is owned by Allah. From beginning to end it is owned by Allah. Which means we cannot act like we own this road. We are also travelers on this road. The one who gives da'wah is not in any better position than the one he is giving da'wah to. Though I'm speaking to you, I have a mic in front of me right now that does not necessarily make me a better traveler on this road than yourself. And it may be that the people who receive this message are far better at traveling on this road than the one inviting them. That happens all the time. And so we have to, the da'i has to be humble to the fact that they're not calling to something that they own. Even the knowledge that I have, I actually don't own that knowledge. It's a gift from Allah, it's His, and I'm calling to something that's His. You know, and we have to separate ourselves from that because a lot of times, it's natural when you're in the business of giving advice, you start feeling like you're better than people. It's just naturally, even subconsciously. Subconsciously, even if the way you, you, the way you look at people can change. You know, you can become condescending without an arrogant, without saying anything arrogant, but you can feel it on the inside. That peace, Rabbika, keeps me and keeps you from going down that road. Ud'u ila sabili Rabbik. Now there are three ways of calling. You can look at it one way, three, three ways of calling to Allah's path. He says, bil hikmah wal mawidat al hasana wa jadilhum bil latihiya ahsan. He says, call them with wisdom, call them with good counsel, and argue with them, debate with them in a way that is best. So I'll have one way of looking at it, then I'll come back and I'll look at it yet another way. Okay? So the first way I'd like to look at it is there are different groups in society, different categories in society. And according to this ayah, it seems that one of the ways you can categorize society is you can think of it as the influential or intellectual leaders of society. The professors, the thinkers, the people in the media, the people that are heads of the major businesses in a, in a society, the political leadership of a society, etc., etc. Those are the intellectual, in a, se- in a sense, elite of a society. Then there is the general population. Huge population, that's the majority of the people. Right? This is all kinds of people, they work in all kinds of professions, or they don't have a profession. These are the men and the women, the children, the general masses of a community. Right? So the, there's the intellectual kind of elite in a sense, and then there's the general masses. And then there's a third category, I'll tell you about that in a second. The thing is, khatibun nas ala qadri uqulihim, you talk to people according to their level. If I'm sitting in a university, and I'm speaking to uh, only professors, the way I will speak is different. If I'm speaking to a group of teenagers, the way I have to speak is different. And what the ayah seems to be suggesting is, one of the implications is, there's a group that you cannot give them simple reminder. They need something intellectual. They need something profound and deep. You know, they need something at the level of hikmah. Something heavier. Then there are people that, you know, they come to the Jum'ah prayer. You cannot give deep philosophy and heavy legal discussion at the Jum'ah prayer. These people just need a simple reminder. al al hasana Give them simple reminders. So for each category of people, there's a different kind of da'wah. A da'wah at the university could be a PhD thesis. That's also da'wah at a university. You know? And then on the, on the other hand, the language that you use, the, the, you know, the style that you use is going to become different entirely when you're talking to the people at a different level. But then there's a third group of people. And this third group of people is a small minority, but they're very loud. These people don't just listen to what you have to say. You know, there's some people, sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't listen. Sometimes they're interested, sometimes they're not interested. But then there are sometimes there are people that are aggressive. They want to fight with you. They want to argue with you. They want to insult what you're saying, refute you. They want to, be, they want to poke at you. They want to create controversy. 
Like in the case of the Prophet wasallam, the majority of people of Mecca were quiet. Majority was quiet. Some people were very loud. Abu Lahab was very loud. Abu Jahl was very loud. You see? In Medina, there were some people that were very loud and aggressive against the Prophet wasallam. The vast majority of the people of Medina, even the non-Muslims were quiet. They were among the masses of people. Now those people that want to debate with you and argue with you and you know, uh, attack Islam, even nowadays there are people that are on the attack against Islam. There's a piece of da'wah about them, but it's not da'wah, really it's jidal. وَجَعَدِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ Engage them, debate with them. Don't run away from them, debate them, but don't use their tactics. Their tactics will be, they will, they will, their voice will get loud, they will use hateful speech, they will use the crowd against you, they will use these kinds of dirty tricks. Allah says, Jadilhum بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Debate them, but in a way that is better. With something better. Meaning, not just we have better arguments, but the way in which we argue is better. They're getting angry, yelling and screaming, we're calm. We don't get upset. We remain cool and collected. They go this way, that way and the other way, but we stay on point, we stay focused. The Qur'an, for, for those of you that are interested, a, a great example of وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ in the Qur'an is Surah Al-Shu'ara, the 26th Surah, towards the end, it's the debate between Musa السلام, and Fir'aun. That's a very good case study of جَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ How did Musa handle Fir'aun? Because Fir'aun is a very loud, angry, aggressive, arrogant politician who's attacking Musa constantly. And he's navigating it in the best possible way. It's incredible. And he's got, Fir'aun has everybody on his side. The only one on the side of Musa alayhi salam is the quiet Harun. You know, <laughs> that's all he has. You know, and yet he's, a, and, and if you study those ayat, by the end of it, Fir'aun is stumped. Fir'aun is defeated in his own court at the hands of Musa alayhi salam. So that's Jadilhum billati hi ahsan. Now, these three, one way that I told you is that in these three words to call with wisdom, to call with good advice and to debate in a better way is three different populations. The intellectuals with wisdom, the common people with good advice and then debate with people that you want to be debated. And this is important also for another reason. I should not debate with everybody. Like if some non-Muslim comes to you and asks you a question, you, stood, you shouldn't just, hey, what about your Bible? What about this? You see your book has these mistakes. Oh wait, hold on. I didn't come here for a debate. I just wanted to eat some food. You know, <laughs> easy. This is why in the ayah, for those of you that are, and many of you are very familiar with the Arabic language, you'll notice, ud'u is not ud'uhum ila sabili rabbi. Qal ud'u. Call. He didn't say call them. He just said call. Because it's open-ended. But when it came to jidal, he said, jadilhum billati hi ahsan. Debate them. In other words, what that means is, da'wah is for everyone. But argument is for a very specific group of people. It's not for everyone. Do not confuse da'wah with argument. That's a last resort and it's used for only the people who are aggressive to begin with. Now let's go back. Another way of looking at these three phrases, inshaAllah ta'ala, that I'd like to share with you. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Well, mawizat al hasana can also mean that you have to, that, that it's out of bayan of a sense. What that means in simple English, call people wisely. Call people to Allah's path wisely. Sometimes, for example, I meet a lot of mothers from around the world. And they say, my son doesn't pray. What should I, I keep telling him to pray. And he doesn't pray. I even yelled at him today and he still didn't pray. And I tell the mother, you know why he doesn't pray? Because you're telling him to pray. And the more you tell him, the less he will pray. Why? Because you're calling, you see, but I'm giving da'wah. Yeah, but you're not using wisdom. That's not wisdom. A teenage boy, an 18 year old, a 17 year old, you have to be a little wise with the way you talk to them. The way you want to convince them of something. And you have to be very patient. It's easier to calm down a wild horse than to take care of a teenager and get them to do something. Two, two very different things. And so what we do a lot of times in our da'wah is we don't use wisdom. 
Some people, for example, in my own family, there are lots of people who listen to my lectures, but there are some people in my family, I will never tell them to do anything. I will get my friend to tell them. Because if I told them, they won't do it. They're allergic to my voice. Okay? So if, even if somebody else said it, exactly the same thing, but since it came from someone else, they'll listen. A lot of wives try to give da'wah to their husbands. Bad idea. Bad idea. He will listen to anyone in the world. But because the khutbah is coming from you, lady, not gonna happen. It's not going to happen. You have to find other ways of reaching. And sometimes da'wah is not with words. Wisdom also means that you're not only giving speeches and quoting and a lot of people, a lot of bad wisdom, you know, or lack of wisdom, a lot of times people say, hey, watch this Numan Ali Khan video. Watch it, watch it. <laughs> Please don't make them watch it. They don't want to watch it. You know, Zakhmah Khan, sure. You know, we have to, uh, sometimes da'wah is just, hey, let's come along, man. let's go for a drive. We'll get some ice cream. And hey, look, can I just stop over? I just have to pray. And you just pull over and you pray at the masjid and they just come in anyway and they feel good coming into the masjid you don't say anything, you don't say, see? masjid, right? it's good, right? No, you don't, you, shh. don't say anything <laughs> that's hikmah hikmah means you have to use tactics you know, other ways of getting people closer to Allah that are sometimes direct and sometimes not direct at all there are people the Prophet wasallam dealt with that he did not preach to he just dealt with them. And the way he dealt with them, they came to Islam. This is the Messenger of Allah, the recipient of the Qur'an. You would imagine anybody who walks in, he will start reciting Qur'an to them. He didn't. He didn't do that. He dealt with different people differently because that's hikmah. This is how you call people. In other words, we have to become a little bit of a psychologist. We have to study people, understand people, where they're coming from, what they need to hear. You know. So a lot of times, for instance, especially within families, I see these scenarios, you know, you have sometimes I, I, I'll, I'll give a speech at a program and a lot of parents are very eager to make their children listen. So they'll bring their, you know, their son or their daughter up to me and say, please give him some advice. You know, this is the worst thing you can do. Because you just embarrass this young man or this young woman, first of all. And for no reason at all, now they hate me for the rest of their life. <laughs> Because <laughs> they won't forget this. So I take, I say to the mother or the father, okay, I'll give them advice, don't worry. And I take them to the side and say, I am so sorry. <laughs> Just relax, I'm not going to give you advice. Take it easy. How's it going? What college do you go to? Just have some other conversation. Just some other conversation. This is part of wisdom, especially within our family, friends. Some of you are at the office, and some of you become so obsessed with da'wah, you have a non-Muslim at the office, every day you see him. By the way, there's only one God. Easy. Easy. You don't have to do that day in and day out. That's hikmah. The second thing is, okay, when you are going to give a message, if you do get a chance to give a message, what is that good, good message? Al-maw'idhat al-hasana. Al-maw'idhat comes from the word wa'ad. And wa'ad actually means advice that reaches the heart. Please remember that, advice that reaches the heart. Now, and, and on top of that Allah mentions beautiful advice that reaches the heart. In other words, you don't make someone feel guilty because that's not beautiful. You don't make someone feel ashamed. You don't make someone feel dirty. You don't make someone feel less. You give them what they, what they need. And by the way, what reaches the heart if somebody is going through trouble, then they need advice about hope. When somebody's going through sadness, you know, you give them advice that will help them cope with their sadness. In other words, the da'i, the speaker, the, the one calling to Allah, is not saying, here's my message, let me give it to you. The da'i is understanding what's going on with this person. What do they need? What advice do they need? What trouble are they having? You know, the, the Christian community is much better at this than we are. Al-Maw'idhat al hasan they are much better than we are. I, I've seen it. I'll give you an example. I was at a church uh, some time ago. Yeah, I go to a church sometimes to understand what they do. So 
So I go to a church and the speech was 10 minutes. The khutbah was 10 minutes. It was on a Wednesday night. And after the 10 minutes, you know what the, the preacher did? There's an audience of about 100 people. He says, so, who's having any trouble? And somebody, I just lost my job. It's pretty hard right now. What's your name? John. Okay everybody, let's pray for John. And they all start praying for him. And then people come and pat him on the shoulder, it's going to be okay. And somebody else comes to him and says, Hey, um, there's, a new, there's an opening in my company, why don't you give me a resume? And, okay, who else is having any trouble? Ah, I just got divorced. <laughs> and then they have a whole conversation. And they pray for him. What, what are they doing? They're actually trying to find out what's going on with people. In, if you want to be a da'i, if I want to be a da'i, I first have to be a listener. I have to be a listener. We are so interested in being heard. We are not interested in hearing. In order to give al mawrid al hasana, you have to spend time with people. You have to understand what's going on with them so you can give them appropriate advice. That's part of wisdom. You know what I'm saying then? I'm saying that a really big part of our da'wah is building relationships with people. Is understanding what they're going through. Your intention is not to convert them. Allah did not say here, ud'uhum ila islam sallimuhum or something. No, no, no. That's not the point. Call them to a road. Maybe that road one day will get them to take shahada. Maybe, maybe not. That's okay. But they still need good advice. The good advice in the Quran is for all human beings. Just give it. And then sometimes you're trying to give good advice and somebody doesn't want to take your advice. You tried to help someone and they became aggressive anyway. And they started yelling at you. That's what, what, is, what applies then? وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَا أَحْسَنُ You don't just walk away, you, you, can, you can defend yourself, but be dignified in the way that you defend yourself. Now having said all these, this is not the conclusion of the ayah. The rest of the ayah I'll briefly share with you. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ ضَلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ Very profound words. He says, your master, in fact, he's the one who knows the lost ones. The ones lost from his path. In other words, I don't decide who is guided and who is misguided. Somebody looks like they are misguided for me, from my eyes. Allah says, you don't know anything. You don't know anything. You don't know if that will be the next alim of the ummah. You have no idea. He is the only one who knows. وَاخْتَصَّ بِسْمِي You know, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ Multiple times. He is the one who knows. You don't know. For a da'i, they have to assume that they don't know where the people's iman is. Because iman is inside the heart. I can only see the outside, I can't see the inside. So I will never be able to judge what's going on. I don't know what's going on with people. I don't know where their iman is. Maybe their iman is much better than I am. Maybe they just don't know any better yet. So Allah says, you don't get to judge. Because a lot of times with da'is, when they're giving da'wah and people are not listening, they get angry. These people are so misguided, they don't even listen. You know, I gave so many speeches and they're still the same way. Which prophet did that? Did a prophet ever advise people and then get angry and say, I, I just spoke to you and you're still like this? <laughs> That's not the way of prophet. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ ضَلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ And then he says, وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ He's the one who knows people that are committed to guidance. In other words, even ourselves, Allah knows better where we stand. So we need to be in a very humble position when we give da'wah, when we, when we share the message of this thing. This is a service to humanity, it's an act of ibadah. Da'wah is an act of ibadah. And it's it just like salah has a protocol, wudu is part of the protocol of salah. Standing and then going in ruku and then coming up and going in sujood is part of the protocol of salah. The same way this ayah is the protocol of da'wah. It's how do you do da'wah? What are the policies that you follow? What are the principles that you follow when you invite? And in such a succinct, very brief, one ayah way, Allah Azza wa Jal has really captured everything a person needs to know about da'wah. And when you understand this, and then you study the da'wah of the prophets across the Qur'an, you'll see this ayah come to life. So this is the theory, and the stories of the prophets and how they spoke is the case studies. That's the proof of concept. 
What are the different situations? And how do you give ma'ud hasana? How do you do da'wah bil hikmah? How do you do jidal bil lati hiya ahsan? All of it's captured there. So th- these are the few ideas that I wanted to remind you know, myself of and all of you of. May Allah Azza wa make our da'wah acceptable in any way, shape or form that we give it. And may Allah Azza wa Jal you know, accept all the efforts, the good work that is being done here. I'm sure you go- guys don't have any questions at all. Or I hope you guys don't have any questions at all. But in case you do, inshallah ta'ala, I'm here. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. Thank you very much to Al Fadil Ustaz Noman Ali Khan. He is very, uh, you know, uh, observing the time. Uh, it fulfill his promise not to be more than 30 minutes. Um, so, MashaAllah. Uh, a very good reminder. Know, a nice uh, manual for, of, of da'wah, I believe, from, from just one single verse from the Qur'an, uh, which I think really fit the theme tonight, where we have representatives from uh, many NGOs who are actively involved in doing da'wah, not just calling people to Islam, but I believe, you know, actively involved in many social economic activities, taking care of the welfare of the people, education, healthy, so many things. So, um, mashallah, we, we really benefit from your uh, short tafkirah tonight. So, as promised, um, if we have any um, questions, I would like to invite um, the questioner to, to firstly um, to introduce yourself, your name, and if you come from any institution, maybe you want to uh, let us know from, from which organization you are from. Uh, please, the question, uh, please sh- short, you know, shorten your question to not more than three minutes. So we have the microphone on uh, your left hand side. So I would like to invite, if there's any question, please come and you may address your question. Fala tafadal mashkura. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Tarakanku uh, Just a simple question But hope to get a uh, long answer uh, I think the most important Thing to do in Dawah is Ikhlas and istiqamah And the more difficult to do is Istiqamah and ikhlas Ikhlas and istiqamah Can you give a few tips How to maintain this In the answer The answer Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, so, the, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the Arabic terms ikhlas and istiqamah, uh, what uh, the, the great question is: the hardest thing to do in dawah work is to remain sincere, to keep your intentions pure, uh, and also remain constant. Meaning, you can you can be doing this work, and eventually you get tired, and you say, "Ah, I'll take a vacation. I don't want to do this anymore." Right? So, th- so that can happen. Both of those things can happen, and of course. Eventually, you can, you can do it so much that you start thinking that it's just become almost like a performance. It's not even you know, genuine anymore. It's, you're not genuinely concerned about people anymore. There are a couple of things that I can say about that. Uh, you know, my favorite example of uh, ikhlas, actually, is Musa a.s. Uh, because Musa a.s., when, he asked to, when Allah told him to speak to Fir'aun, he asked for Harun. And when he asked for Harun, he first of all acknowledged his own shortcomings. Huwa afsahu minni lisanan. He's more eloquent a speaker than I am. It's amazing to me because Musa السلام, is the most quoted in the Quran. And he says Harun speaks better. And Harun spoke barely in the Quran. <laughs> but Musa السلام, says he's a better speaker. So the first thing is that you have to acknowledge your weaknesses. And you have to be completely, you don't see yourself in competition with other da'is. People come to me all the time, you know, I like Mufti Mank more. And I say, me too. (laughs) Is there a competition? No. No. There are people that are providing a remarkable service. They're doing some amazing things. And they're doing things that I cannot do. And the other people are doing things, or I'm doing things that somebody else cannot do. And that's okay. We do whatever best we can, but we acknowledge our shortcomings, and we're not ashamed to acknowledge our shortcomings. That's number one. Number two, part of ikhlas is giving other people credit. 
Allah, Musa is standing in front of Allah and the first place, he says, Harun is a good idea. Makes a recommendation for someone else. You know? Instead of just telling Allah, Ya Allah, you can give anything you want. You can turn a stick into a snake. You can fix my tongue. Why don't you just fix my tongue? Then I don't have that problem and I don't need Harun. <laughs> I'll be the superhero myself. No, he says, give me Harun. So giving other people position, giving other people credit, bringing them up, that's part of your ikhlas. Then the most beautiful thing, كَيْنُ سَبِّحَكَ كَثِيرًا He says, give him to me so we can do tasbih of you together. What does tasbih have to do with da'wah? They're not going to stand in front of Fir'aun and say, SubhanAllah, 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 SubhanAllah. They're not going to do that. Why is he saying, we will declare Allah's perfection together? You know what that is? When you say that Allah is perfect, then you are reminding yourself that you are what? Not perfect. We will together remind each other that only Allah is perfect. When I make a mistake, He will correct me and I'll be okay. Because I know that the only one perfect is Allah. And when He makes a mistake, I will correct Him and that will be our tasbih. Our tasbih is not just that Allah is perfect, but we remind each other we are imperfect. What does that mean for a, for a da'i? When a da'i is corrected, when a da'i is criticized, and a da'i gets angry, you, you're gonna correct me, I'm on YouTube. You know? <laughs> no. Because that, that means you don't understand tasbih. Tasbih means perfection is only for Allah. And he asked, give me someone who can correct me. And I can correct them. We can help each other. And that's the attitude of a da'i. That keeps what? Ikhlas. And by the way, that also keeps istiqama. Ushdud bihi azri. Give, him, give me my brother and he will give me back up. When I'm getting tired, when I'm slowing down, he's going to push me. And when he's backing up, I'm going to push him. You cannot do this work alone. You need people that support you, that carry you. Because if you try to do this alone, you will burn out. You will run out of energy. And those are just a, a, a quick example of how both istiqama and ikhlas are beautifully captured in the story of Musa a.s. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is uh, Adam. I'm from uh, Al Islah, an association called Al Islah. So I'm a teacher by day and a father by night. So you, you said something about becoming a psychologist to understand people, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in my school, there are a lot of students, and uh, you know their behavior, uh, you know, distinct with each other. It's different behavior, you know, not the same behavior. You know, what I mean. So can you tell me how do I, you know, how do I, like a general rule in, understand, in understanding people, how do I do that? Oh man, thank you. <laughs> general rule in understanding people, oh my god. Um, the, well the easy thing that I can tell you is, um, in order to really, especially young people, if you want to understand young people, then you have to get them to open up to you. And they don't open up to you in a group. Like individually, if you befriend young kids and uh, you know teenagers, etc., and they get them to a point where they speak to you. Well, you're not speaking to them. A lot of times, we're just giving the speech. We're doing the talking. Uh, if you really want to understand people, you know, you, uh, what I used to do, for example, when I used to work with youth, is I did not give them durus. I didn't. I took them to go get donuts. I took them to the beach. Played basketball with them. There's, I did other things with them until they saw me as a friend and then they would call me in the middle of the night and say, hey, I, I have a problem, there's this girl or something and then I would talk to them then I, I'm, I'm now ready to give them advice because I, until then I have no idea what's going on in his head I have no clue so even if I give them advice, maybe it has no benefit for them because they're in a different, different frequency so breaking that ice means you have to interact with young people and the more you do, the more you'll develop an understanding of them. It's, it's simple, isn't it? Your close friends, you understand them. Why do you understand them? Because you spend a lot of time with them. You deal with them, you interact with them. You see how they behave. So as a da'i, especially in the teacher capacity, you are in a da'i capacity. So building that relationship with your students is very important. Inshallah. 
Um, okay, we have one more question. Uh, may I just want to uh, see a collect of hands if, if you intend to ask any more questions after this? Or So we have uh, one more there. Okay, so yes, uh, so, so after this, brother, there'll be uh, one last question and then the, inshallah we're going to end the, the session. So please, brother, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, Mufta. My name is Dr. Amir Shah. I'm an oncologist by profession and I'm from IPSI Penang, which is a Dawa society. Now, I just want to share with you a few things that we do so that we can learn more from you. The problem we have today is, as you know, everybody has easy access to the technology and internet. And it's not easy for us to speak about scientific miracles of Quran to everyone, though we try to find the right people to speak to. And the non-Muslims in Penang, they succeed because of the way they penetrate. One of the ways is healthcare. So they provide healthcare because they know sick people are desperate. And therefore, when they portray their religion, people tend to get more interested, which we lack a little bit. However, one of the problems we face is the misconceptions and perceptions about Islam. Before we can even show a good example, they would come back and tell us Islam is about terrorism, Islam is about this and that, you do all these backwards things because of the information they read. As you know, there might be 100 good websites about Islam, that's but triple websites about anti-Islam. So they're confused. Right. So how do we penetrate to these people to look beyond the misconceptions of Islam? How do we tell them, look at the beauty of Quran, don't look at Muslims? Is that the right thing to say? Don't look at Muslims today, but look at Islam. How do we tell them that? Thank you, Sheikh. You're quite welcome. That's a very pertinent and a very painful question. Uh, the, the first thing I'd like to share with you is, yes, internet has a lot of propaganda against Islam, but did Allah teach us how to handle this problem? I would argue yes. Uh, and I, I go back to my default position, the story of Musa alayhi salam. Why, why do I go back there is because when this da'wah of Musa started, it's officially started with the Pharaoh, Fir'aun had the entire media of Egypt. And he was using every angle possible to, dis to show not only that Musa is a liar, but yadhaba bi tariqatikumul musla, he will, Musa and Harun are going to destroy your lifestyle. They are a threat. They are basically terrorists. This is the, this is the messaging of Fir'aun across Egypt. So the idea that Islam is dangerous, Islam is a threat, uh, Islam is violent, and therefore stay away from it, this kind of messaging that you're finding online today is not only something that we experience now, this has been there. This is, this is actually an old tactic. We also have to acknowledge, secondly, the difficult reality. There are Muslims who have done horrible things and continue to do horrible things in the name of Islam. And they, even if they are a very, very small minority, they are still Muslims. And they, their actions are so loud, and the media uses their actions and makes them so loud that our voices are no longer heard. That is a very serious problem. To me, the solution to that problem is a few things. We have to first of all acknowledge that no matter how much we say don't look at the Muslims, that's never going to work. That is a horrible argument. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say, look at Qur'an, don't look at me. Look at, look at the Book of Allah, don't look at the Sahaba. The, the, we, the reason people came to Islam is because of the character of the believers. A lot of the people that came to Islam in this part of the world, in Southeast Asia, is because of the way Muslims carried themselves in business. A huge portion of people. They didn't say, read Qur'an, but let me cheat you in business. You know, we cannot use that as an excuse. So then what do we do? Because I cannot change how other Muslims are behaving. At the very, very least, the, the organization that you're a part of, or the efforts that you're a part of, they should actually, doesn't matter what people say, you should be the best you know, social services organization of all. I can tell you, most people are not attracted to religion because of arguments. I said, ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Hikmah is high level. Most people are not high level. 
It's wal mawaizatil hasana. Good counsel. And good counsel touches what did I say? It touches the heart. You touch the heart when you actually serve people, when you when you're helping people, when you're engaged with people, when they see you, and when they see you, there'll be a contradiction. You people are really nice, but Islam is really bad. And you say that's okay. We're still nice. And you don't argue, you just keep serving. Eventually they say something is wrong. One of this is not correct. One of this is not correct. So they're going to have to decide whether they're going to believe the media or they're going to believe what they see with their eyes with you, what they experience with you. You're going to have to create that contradiction. That's, that's what our responsibility has become now. And we may not be able to do it at an international scale, but we have to start doing it at least at a very local scale. You know, at least my neighbor is confused. Wait, Muslims are bad, but why are you so nice? At least I confuse my neighbor. That's that one. <laughs> you know, that's what we have to now become. Inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Roslan from Hidayah Center, Penang. Uh, you giving very simple formula, which is called uh, the protocol of Dawah from this ayah you mentioned at the very beginning of the speech. Focusing more on how to do Dawah to non muslim I'm trying to bring the perspective towards the workers of Islam, which is very problematic uh, now, even in Malaysia, where one group claiming that they are on the right path, and others not with them, is the, on the wrong path, and then we wasting time uh, hitting each other, uh, writing on the internet, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so what is the advice to this group, as well as uh, we ourselves coming from different NGOs, as a reminder so that we focus on the, on the, on the Dawah, but uh, uh, not focusing on, uh, on hitting each other, uh, which is causing a lot of problem and a bad image to even non, non-Muslim, all of them. That's a, that's a fantastic question. I'm really grateful that you asked that question. Um, as a student of Qur'an, I can tell you that the case study for Muslims becoming divisive and undoing the da'wah is actually the, the study of Banu Israel, the Israelites. And how they broke apart and how they used the knowledge of the religion. Okay. How they used the knowledge of the religion to... Uh, Undermine each other. Allah Azza wa Jalla will describe وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمِ They didn't fall into division until after knowledge had come to them. In other words, knowledge was used as a means of fighting against each other. Because for them, for Banu Israel, what happened was one scholar, one alim, people come and listen to him. Then there's some other alim, people come and listen to him. And this alim says, why are they listening to him? I lost half my customers. So, he starts giving speeches against that guy and how wrong he is and how they shouldn't be misguided by him. It became like market competition. Islam became an industry to them. The religion became an industry where they're all competing with each other. That's all it became. It wasn't about the truth anymore. The same thing applies within the ummah, not just with scholars, but also with organizations. We have a da'wah organization, they have a da'wah organization. But why are they, why are there more people at their da'wah organization? Why did they, their convention was more successful than our convention. You know what? We will have our convention on the same exact day. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. That's Banu Israel behavior. <laughs> That's what that is. You know? And so, we have to first acknowledge that this work, if you, you know, there are going to be multiple efforts. It's okay to have a hundred different organizations. It's completely fine. And it's okay that they, you know, some people say, why can't we just have one organization? No, it's never going to happen. Just like we can't have one family. 
Every family works differently. So it's okay, every organization works differently. Sometimes you come together and do something together, and most of the time you do your own thing, it's completely fine. So for some efforts, everybody unites. For some causes, everybody unites. For some project, everybody unites. And then they go their own way. That's complete, and that's actually the recommended course of action. As far as Muslims hating each other and you know bashing each other and kind of that kind of thing, I tell you, that is the worst thing we could have done to the Ummah. Because when Muslims are fighting each other, you know who's hurting the most? First of all, non-Muslims are no longer interested in Islam because these people even hate each other. But the more important, the more dangerous conclusion of that is we lose our next generation. The next generation of Muslims says these old people, all they do is fight each other. I'm not interested in Islam. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُورِثُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَفِي شَكٍّ مِنْهُ مُرِيدٍ those who got the book after them, they are doubtful about it altogether. They don't, they're not even interested in the religion. We're destroying our next generation because of this kind of argument. I would suggest to you, if there's a debate like that happening and people come to you, and there are lots of debates happening in Malaysia, by the way. And people ask me, so what is your opinion, Ustaz? So I could be on one side or the other side, I don't have an opinion. And actually I have a lot of opinions, but I'll never tell you. You know? And that should be the policy you develop. Some conversations are worth killing. They don't deserve to be kept going. They deserve to be buried. So when they are brought up at a party, or at a masjid, or at a gathering, you say, not interested. Just not interested. Somebody brought it up this morning. He says, what do you think about the Shias and the Sunnis? I was like, I don't think about the Shias and the Sunnis. I'm thinking about lunch though, I'm hungry. <laughs> You don't have to get involved in these debates, you don't. It's because we keep bringing, bringing them back to life that the problem continues. We don't have to bring them back to life. We can bring better things back to life. There are other priorities of the Ummah that are not being addressed that we can make into our priority. So that's, that's a, you know, a small bit of you know, what I think about this problem. There are, there's lots to say about this issue of how Muslims have now become divisive. I would finally like to add this ayah is not just about da'wah to uh, non-Muslims. I would argue this ayah is a, about da'wah itself. Which means Muslims or non-Muslims, it doesn't matter. Even within Muslims, there are some circles where you need hikmah, other circles where you need al mawad al-hasana, other circles where you need jidal billati hi ahsan. It actually applies universally. Barakallahu li wa lakum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much to all uh, those who...